Uh, Raz, who will be um, the chair of the panel or session um, on um, family medicine. So, the, and palliative, oh, you now have palliative care as part of it? Yeah. Oh, I never knew that before. Okay. <laughs> now I know. Family medicine and palliative care. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, colleagues. Good afternoon, friends and colleagues. I'm not going to do much talking. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of we have five speakers, five minutes each, with a little bit one minute in between for questions and answers, and we'll be changing over rapidly in between our speakers. Uh, we I invite Diane to start proceedings. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. I am Diane Matthews, and I will be discussing um, our proposed scoping review on resilience literature among health sciences students. I am uh, one member of our team. The other members include Taslim Rust and Nsiki Mapukata. So the emerging patterns that suggest globally that the, there's a higher mental health burden amongst university students compared to the general population. Um, evidence uh, suggests that health science students training, um, so the actual health science education and training where health science education takes place, exposes students to um, increased risk of psychological distress, specifically during their training. The literature is um, replete with an understanding and definition in different aspects of resilience, um, but our aim is to develop or produce a cohesive definition of resilience which is locally and contextually driven. And we will do this, or we'll aim to do this using um, evidence-based and evidence-based methodology. So our methodology uh, will be, as mentioned, a scoping review. Uh, with the help of our resident librarian, we've already identified our research question as well as our search strategy using already established templates um, which will help us register our protocol. Um, the registering of our protocol will take pl place through Prospero and our uh, and Prisma, which are which are the already established templates, um, helping us work through our scoping review. So to talk a little bit about our aims and objectives, I am, um, we've managed to attain the help of uh, Arxi and O'Malley. They've developed a suitable framework for a scoping review that helps us um, identify a step-by-step -step approach um, of working through our scoping review. Um, so. Our step one, as I mentioned, was identifying our research question. And some of our aims and objectives include um, reviewing the definitions or the already existing definitions of resilience in our specific population, which is undergraduate health science students, reviewing and categorizing uh, the strategies used to improve resilience in this population. It also includes describing factors which are specific to health science education that influence resilience and the role that resilience plays in the mental health of health science students. This will then enable us to identify the areas that are needing research within our local context. So step two involves identifying the relevant literature so we've done that, and the databases that we've identified include um, PubMed. Um, we've used MeSH terms like students, undergraduate, health occupations, resilience, emotional adjustment, adaptation, coping, hardiness, or grit. The other databases that we've identified um, include EBSCO host, Africa Wide, Sunal, Eric, Psych Info, and Scopus. Some of our gray literature will be sourced from Primo, ProQuest dissertations, as well as Google Scholar. 
So we find ourselves currently at step three, which is our study selection. Because there are three of us, two of us will review the literature. Well, all of us will review, review the literature. Two, and the, but the third, the, the, uh, so two of us will review, and the third will referee consensus on what our inclusion criteria are. Our eligibility and inclusion criteria will, however, be developed post hoc, and this will be quite an iterative and discursive process as we become more familiar with the literature. We'll then move on to step four, which will be to chart the data using those specific categories. And this will help us develop a thematic approach, which will then enable us to analyze the literature that we have reviewed. So we would love to, or our hope is to provide a comprehensive overview of the, pub the, the published literature within this population therefore identifying gaps for our future research and ultimately contributing to a local African understanding of resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Will. <coughs> Excuse me, we'll take some comments. So one comment, one question while David comes up and loads his talk. Great. Right. Well done, Diane, thank you. Hello, good afternoon everyone. My name is David Huang and I'm the ex-family medicine registrar who is now busy with my MMED uh, in the Division of Family Medicine. So I'm just presenting some of the preliminary data for my MMED, uh, for, the, for the work for my MMED, which uh, is actually the eight year, titled Eight Years of FTC in Primary Care. Actually, look at the reasons for, the, for, for changing the th this therapeutic regimen. So as we know, the fixed dose combinations, FTC actually a misnomer. So the FTC I'm referring here, it's actually the Odomi or the Troiza trademark name, which is turned off of the dasaproxyl fumarate, imtricitabine and ephavirate, the three drug combination, which is introduced or was introduced to our public health sector in around 2013, Western Cape earlier than that, around 2010, and is now currently still the recommended first line ART for HIV-1 infections for ad adults and adolescents in our country. So as you all know, there's a new regimen around the block, which is called the TLD-FTC. So it's also one tablet, fixed dose combination, which uh, composes of turn off of a lamivudine, which is quite similar to intracetabine, and then the dolutegravir, which is the new drug that we're going to get in public health sector, which is an integrating inhibitor. So what is the big deals of this, like as we all the HIV clinicians are talking about? So it's actually the, um, we, we know that ephedrine's now kind of, although it shows that it's not inferior to protease inhibitors, but actually dolutegravir shows more superior efficacy in terms of HIV uh, suppression than over ephedrine. So also dolutegravir is more genetically robust against resistance, so it actually takes more genetic re uh, mutations to occur before the HIV gets resistance to dolutegravir. And then it also has better side effect profile. So we all know that ephedrine is notorious for its neuropsychiatric and also long-term increase in sociodality and also impaired glycemic and lipid metabolism and control. And also from a public health level uh, perspective, dolutegravir is also cheaper to manufacture. So it's 50 milligram standard dosing versus 600 milligrams, which is required for ephedrine. So however, dolutegravir all sounds good, but it's not a magic bullet yet for our, um, to sort out our HIV pandemic. So um, there's also concerns, a global concern with women of childbearing age. So we all know what's happening in Botswana. There's a higher increase or incidence of neurotube defect with the use of dolutegravir um, with newborn babies. And also the requiring dosing change for first line TB regimens specific to risk ampersen that's required from daily dosing of dolutegravir to by daily dosing. So that's kind of like a problem with our country, with our setup with this high HIV and TB co-infection rate. So maybe just a time that before we starting to introduce, hopefully coming uh, towards the end of 2019, definitely hopefully 2020, we get started taking away in the state sector. Maybe now is the time to look at or revise our old regimen, the tenofovir interested being ephedrine FDC, to look at actually how well or badly is ephedrine doing, or so specifically more ephedrine, uh, in, in our setup in a South African primary healthcare setting. So the 
basically we're looking at the prospective for our studies or for the reviews of all the patients over the past eight years who started ARVs, uh, specifically the autoimmune um, combinations. Uh, these patients presumably not naive, so it's never exposed to any ARVs before. And then basically we look at the percentage that's of these patients who started this regimen, how many are they required uh, any drug change, whether it be single drug change or the entire regimen change before the sensor date, and then how long does um, the this change occur? So how long does the TEE FDC last before the change has to take place? And then what's the reason for the change? So the preliminary data I've got so far is that the number of patients that were started during this time of the eight-year period were 5,979. 5, and of these, actually 1,752 required some kind of drug change before the sensor date. So this is approximately 29% of the patient that had to require, requiring some form of drug change, which this figure is actually above what we expected from our literature review, that this continuation rates due to efavirenz adverse effects lies about 10%, whereas the tenovavir, which is better tol tolerated, it's about 7.7%. Lamivudine and trastuzumab is quite tolerated, so the side effects or any, it's, it's quite rare, so it wasn't that of significant. And then there's a background HIV-1 um, resistance to non-nukes, which is the efavirenz, it's about 11%. So we can see that the, um, from the literature, from studies in other setups, we kind of rough, roughly estimate about 10 to 15 percent, if not more, 20 percent of um, reasons for the change. But actually, in our setup, it was 29 percent. So uh, further reviews. <laughs> so other. So the. So the, my next steps in my work for my MA is the to actually look at actual folders to determine the reasons for those changes. Those um, 1,752 patients. What were the reasons for for those changes? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Tsepo. If there are any comments or questions for David. Thanks for that presentation. Quick question. Um, are you looking at all at the effect of the fixed dose combinations on viral suppression and how, I mean, you've looked mainly at drug changes, but have yeah, you looked so at viral suppression? Are you asking, is that for the, the efficacy of the viral yeah. suppression? So um, that would be my, that wouldn't be my primary objectives of, of looking at it. Um, so, so my sample size, I'm not powered to look at those. Obviously, from the data I'm collecting, I will see how many of those actually does, um, does have a viral unsuppressed as a reason, reason for the drug change, and then how many percentage are that are because of viral load and suppression. Um, but but, but my, my study, the objective was not looking at the efficacy compared with that. Thank you, David. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tsepo Mutsui. I'm presenting this data set. It's a uh, sub data set on behalf of a joint team. Uh, we've been working with the um, uh, Institute of Aging, uh, Walter Susulu and Albertina Susulu Institute of Aging with uh, our PI, uh, Sebastiana Kululo, couldn't join us today. I think, oh, is she here? Um, and we, it's, we looked at this data as part of um, a multi-phase study. So this was the first phase in a larger study uh, whose primary aim was to look at testing the implementation of the WHO primary healthcare toolkit. So the background to this is that the World Health Organization has developed a scientifically sound toolkit to assist primary care centers to implement what has come to be termed the WHO age-friendly principles. Uh, and the idea of the toolkit is to approach uh, the assessment of what has come to be called the four geriatric giants, uh, falls in mobility, incontinence, uh, memory impairment, and two major chronic diseases, uh, hypertension and diabetes. So uh, it's, this becomes helpful for us at primary care because the setup in the primary care public services is that queues are long uh, and there's obviously a feeling 
and need to be able to simplify the approach to multimorbidity and complexity with managed with, with caring for, for, for older persons. So the tools enable the healthcare team to be able to identify specific problems uh, common to older persons and, and to shift the focus from disease orientation to, to prevention, where you have in the long waiting queues and in waiting areas uh, lay people who have been trained to be able to apply screening, screening tools, which would then focus um, the attention of the clinician inside the consulting room to specific problems. Uh, so the idea of this study is to be able to see whether the implementation of these tools at two primary care facilities actually improves uh, clinical care and outcome. So this first phase was looking at um, uh, the experiences. So the first part was looking, uh, assessing age friendliness at the two facilities, namely Vanguard and Hanover Park. Uh, phase two being then to train clinicians uh, with the use of the toolkit. And then phase three then being to come back to reevaluate in different three, four different formats, uh, folder reviews, clinicians, experiences of, of patients who've been exposed to the toolkit and see whether there's some sort of substantive improvement. Uh, just with regard to this small subset, then we use convenience sampling to um, run focus groups uh, both uh, of us were clinicians who were based at the facility, so uh, we couldn't really use uh, bracketing in, term, in terms of uh, looking at the uh, the data set. Uh, and we had we ran there were 33 clients, uh, all above the age of 60 or participants, um, and we collected data using a dual moderator method using a, a facilitator who was fluent in all three languages. Um, and we interviewed pretty much until saturation. We weren't able to do member checking, although there were uh, other moments of triangulation that we were able to, to pull off and corroborate. So the main themes were, one, uh, despite the challenges that there's overall good, good care, <coughs> Uh, is one thing that came through. So in spite of uh, clients being, uh, participants being aware of problems in the facilities, they felt that there was generally good care. Uh, the second theme had to do with communication gaps and it uh, manifested at the level of feeling unheard about how facility systems could be improved. Uh, and secondly, with the frustration of remaining silent uh, was apparent also at the clinical interface where uh, participants felt that clinicians didn't fully, fully address the, their need. And this desire was um, it went beyond um, participating, uh, also in participating in internal facility processes uh, and decision making about where facilities should be located. So clients felt that they, uh, participants felt that they had been left out of them. Uh, the third theme that came through was that uh, the health system was experienced as, as unreliable. So there was this uh, persistent view of it being stretched. Uh, and this actually led to clients reporting, uh, having to resort to other means of attending to their needs and making the system work for them, including corrupt, corrupt practices like uh, bribing your way to get, to get in or to get services. Uh, the other th two themes that came through uh, was a perva uh, pervasive ageism which was experienced. And this, there were explicit and implicit references to ageism made throughout the data. Uh, and the view was consistently expressed of being treated differently because of being older. Um, and this was this differentiation was most explicitly noted in the way in which um, staff members communicated with clients. Uh, and lastly, a perception that uh, the care is uh, the quality of the care is linked to the to the level of the of the healthcare worker. So in as much as primary care is supposed to be nurse driven and doctor supported, there was an, a feeling that the experience with at the level of primary care nurses was not as good as, as, as that from clinicians and doctors. Uh, those are most of the findings uh, and we'll, then the rest of the data analysis is still continuing. Thank you. Thank you, Sepo. Perfect timing, any questions or comments? Uh, Prof. Les Gwether is going to just say a few words about palliative care before we launch into our Let's next, our next um, session. I need to go to the desktop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
thank you very much and I uh, applaud your stamina in uh, continuing through today. I just wanted to give a brief background to um, the palliative medicine team within the Division of Family Medicine and then we've got two presentations, one from um, our MPhil patient and one I'm actually doing on behalf of Lindsay Farrant who's ill. <coughs> so those are the um, staff um, within the department, um, myself, Renee Krauser, so we've got three full-time people, Renee, Linda, and Naomi, and then some part-time people, Lindsay, Joy, Olono, and Revo, are busy on our current research project. <coughs> So we have a, a very um, diffuse teaching activity. Undergraduate programs are convened by Linda Gankha and um, Linda, Alan, Lee, Renee, and with Lindsay kind of filling in if anyone's on leave or helping on the undergraduate program in the second and third years in fourth year and final year. Uh, Renee convenes the postgraduate diploma in palliative care and Shannon uh, assists her and I act as the kind of... Um, moderator of the assignment marking and exam marking. And we nurtured the pediatric program from 2009 to 2017, when the Department of Pediatrics agreed to give a home to pediatric palliative care. So we're very pleased that the pediatric um, discipline has also accepted that palliative care is sometimes necessary for children. Um, the MPhil program I convene, and we have a lot of assistance in, of supervisors within the school, um, and then most of our family medicine staff, our palliative medicine staff also do some supervision. So just a snapshot of some of the research that we've done because um, UCT for a long time was the only postgraduate program in palliative medicine on the continent. We're still the only postgraduate palliative medicine program in the country. We were part of a four-site study validating a patient-reported outcome measure called the African Palliative Care African pa Patient Outcome Scale, which we used to measure quality of care. That same program also did a patient needs assessment for cancer and HIV. And the OPCAP study was looking specifically at oncology patients and what their palliative care needs were and um, out of that has come another program that I haven't actually put in there which Renee Krauser researched and implemented palliative care training for oncologists because we believe that oncologists should be able to provide palliative care. The heart failure study at Hudiskia also identified palliative care needs in people with heart failure. And the ASSET project that I'm going to talk about right now is looking at chronic lung disease and developing an intervention to assist those people. We're looking at a palliative care indicator tool because one of the things that clinicians have a problem with is deciding when to refer for palliative care. So it's trying to give triggers. This is when who needs palliative care. And you've heard uh, Juanita's study on integration of palliative care into the Western Cape Health System, and uh, Renee's looking at integration into Hudiscure. The costing of palliative care services, and it's really wonderful to see Health Economics Unit coming on with that wonderful study that Linda described to us this morning. The Medical Research Council has actually put out a um, document called Saving Lives, Saving Costs, where they estimate that if the Department of Health the National Department of Health paid for home-based care palliative care services, they would save the health system 2.6 million, 2.6 billion rand per year. So when we look at robust costing studies, that's also going to be a good um, uh, motivation for investing in palliative care. And then my own PhD was on palliative care. How is it part of the right to health in South Africa? And then we are involved in a lot of social responsibility programs, supporting hospice services. We developed standards for palliative care in the non-governmental sector. So there are standards for hospitals and clinics, but nobody's looked at standards for CBOs. So we have disasters like the Gauteng Mental Marathon disaster because um, community-based organizations <laughs> organizations don't have to um, comply with standards at the moment. We support the children's palliative care programs and Linda Gunker in particular does a lot of counseling for um, staff and 
uh, parents and children's palliative care. We contributed to the National Steering Committee of Palliative Care and developed the national policy framework with many years of advocacy internationally and nationally leading to the World Health Assembly Resolution of Palliative Care, which as Juanita identified says that palliative care is an ethical responsibility of health systems and that it's an ethical duty of healthcare professionals to provide palliative care to those in need. And the indicator tool will tell us who are in need of that palliative care. Juanita heads up the um, Western Cape Palliative Care Task Team that we also to contribute to, particularly on the education and the research sides. So I just wanted to give that background to the work that we're doing in palliative care and then to ask Rada to come and talk about her study looking at the <coughs> palliative care in the emergency unit, which has been identified by the Western Cape Task Team as a real need to have palliative care for people who respond in the emergency medical services. Okay. Rada. Hi. So Rada Govinda, Master Students in Palliative Medicine. I'm surrounded by people who have lobbied in the field for decades, and I'm supported by people who have worked in the area for many, many years, but I'm relatively new to palliative medicine. But there's nothing quite like watching somebody you love suffer over several days in the presence of multiple specialists. That made me stop and think, we can do better than this, we have to do better than this. And that's what drew me to this field, this relatively new field of palliative medicine. My topic is a determination of the prevalence and the reasons why palliative care patients present to the Kruterskir Hospital Emergency Department. So prevalence is the count. How many patients do we have in the emergency department and what proportion of those are palliative care? And that requires an identification of who is palliative care. Um, uh, the reasons that patients present to an emergency department is, it's in my having done that portion of the work, it typically springs to mind exacerbated symptoms that bring patients to an emergency department. So those reasons are technically symptoms. What brings you to the ED? That last bit we logged on pretty much well into the proposal, the, identify, the identification of the needs of carers, because it's not just the needs of the patient that brings, a, that brings a patient to an emergency department. It is often the needs of a carer, unmet needs of a carer, unsupported needs of a carer that will bring a patient to an emergency department. And we latch that on in the end, and those technically are the objectives of the study. So why is the study important? Um, there's a huge potential to change the experience of seriously ill patients, their families, and the treating doctors in an emergency department. What are treating, what are emergency doctors, what are doctors working in an emergency department trained to do? They're trained to focus on stabilizing a patient, on preserving the life of the patient for ongoing treatment elsewhere. What happens though? when preserving the life of the patient does not contribute to an increase in quality of life for that patient in any way? Or what happens when the things that you are trained to do are in direct contrast to the wishes of a patient who has declared how he wants to spend his last days or his last weeks of life? Um, so there's a huge potential to change this experience for seriously ill patients and their families in an ED. The emergency department is also a catch-all of all kinds of patients. What happens to this vulnerable group of patients that, have, that are known to have acute exacerbations, sudden onset acute exacerbations uh, due to the kind of illnesses that they bear? They come to an emergency department and often doctors will find there that they don't know that they are seriously ill. Um, there is an opportunity to manage all of this in a, in a better way in an emergency department. We need to improve our understanding of the profile and symptom burden of seriously ill patients. Now, there is lots of data available on what happens in other countries. If you just Google palliative medicine, generally, you'll get over a million articles on Google Scholar. Google palliative medicine Africa, and we're down to 44,000 articles on Google Scholar. So we know what's happening in other parts of the world, typically in first world parts of the world, but we don't know what is happening here. We don't have our own picture, and we don't know what our symptom burden is, and we don't know what our profile is in an emergency department. So let me give you an example of a, one of the hugest studies that was done in Ontario, Canada. Two minutes. In Ontario, Canada, 91,500 patients were studied. They were cancer patients only who had died over the four-year period. So the patients had died, and what the researchers did is that they did a retrospective study of what their experience was and what their visits were to uh, an emergency department, because multiple, vis multiple visits to an emergency department are deemed to be an indicator of poor quality of care. They found that some are avoidable, that with, with better support of the, to, to the patients and to the carers, some of the visits 
were avoidable, but some of the visits are not avoidable. And it's because of the vul vulnerable nature of this group, because of the acute onset, um, the ac sudden and, and acute on uh, sudden onset of 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 of, and of acute symptoms, that they actually do need support from an emergency department from time to time. Um, there is an absence of SOPs regarding identification and management of palliative care patients, not in Krotoskir Hospital, however. Krotoskir has a palliative care referral sheet, um, and they actually identify and set out um, 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 a means to identify who is a palliative care patient. For example, when is a chronic kidney disease a palliative care patient? A chronic kidney disease patient, a palliative care patient. According to the Krutuskir Hospital referral form, it is a palliative care patient in end stage or a palliative care patient who has been declined or, or a kidney disease patient who has been declined for dialysis. When is a patient with respiratory issues a palliative care patient? When they present with disabling um, uh, with disabling um, um, uh, ability to breathe, a New York Heart Association, class four, or when they've had more than five admissions over a six month period. So those guidelines, while they're not um, used throughout South Africa, they do exist for Krutus Care Hospital and I use them to identify palliative care patients here. Um, there is a national policy framework and strategy on palliative care, which was um, which was published and, and adopted in 2017, and those goals need to be achieved by 2022. And this research will feed into those goals, um, which is to, will feed into one of those goals, which is to strengthen palliative care services across all levels of the health system. And lastly, there is limited data. So developing countries contribute to 1% of palliative medicine research globally. So we don't know what our picture is. We don't know what our story is. So all research in this area is going to is going to just enhance our picture and, 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 and our experience and will allow us to better improve our services to palliative care patients. Why else is this research is important is because, funnily enough, nowhere in the world has it been determined of all the patients that come into an emergency department, how many of those and what proportion of those are palliative care patients. There's thousands of, of pieces of work that have been published on palliative care patients and emergency department, but no prevalence. So we're guesstimating at prevalence. Um, so this will be, this research will definitely be one of, will contribute to that, to that gap in research. Thank you. I'm out. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks. Let's do the last presentation. Here we go on the ACID project. So I'm um, presenting on behalf of Lindsay Ferrant, who is um, coordinating this research, where we're looking at integrating uh, palliative care into the primary um, health care sector and looking particularly at patients with chronic lung disease in the primary health care setting. This is part of a bigger project that's funded by the NIR. HR in the UK and our partner is King's College in London. So COPD is the fourth leading cause of death globally and is predicted to be the third leading cause by 2030 and palliative care has been found to be appropriate for patients with advanced COPD. That Palliative care alongside usual care for people living with COP can reduce breathlessness, reduce hospitalization, so health care costs. There is self-mastery is one of the words that has come out of this research, that people learn how to better manage their own breathlessness without going into the anxiety panic cycle that can happen. There's improved quality of life, less distressed, improved satisfaction with care, improved dignity, and in fact also improved survival. So we've just completed the diagnostic phase of this study, and we have um, a lot of discussion, and thank very much Richard Finsale smith who's been talking about the fact that actually in South Africa and in Africa, we're not talking about COPD as we find it in Europe and North America. We're talking about chronic lung disease that may not be due to a smoking background. It may be used because of biofuels and people using open fires to cook on. It may be other environmental toxins um, that are um, breathed in, inhaled. And so we're looking more and we're more and more using the term chronic lung disease, uh, um, responding to Richard Finsale-Smith's um, advice. 
So the normal activities were reasonably high. They, they had normal activity and able to care for themselves, but COPD or the chronic lung disease stops them doing the things that they want to do. They're breathless walking around the home when getting washed, getting dressed. They're breathless when they talk. Their cough makes them tired. Their chest symptoms disturb their sleep. Exercise, they think, is not safe. And everything they do is um, too much effort. They're also afraid and they also panic easily because they don't feel in, in control of their breathing. So the specific um, symptoms were that over 70% have shortness of breath, which you would understand. The uh, items in black are physical symptoms. The items in the blue-purple are psychological symptoms. So, so worry, feeling sad, feeling nervous, feeling irritable. Pain is still very high. It's nearly 62%. So, and then there's also... A, a relatively high proportion, just over 20%, who are at risk of major depression. The qualitative interviews found that they had physical and psychological burden, a financial and a practical burden, and they wanted information and education. So the next stage of our study, which we will be starting in January, <coughs> or we're looking, we're developing the the intervention now to test it from January. A feasible and acceptable primary care-led integrated palliative care intervention that we're going to implement at three different sites in a step wedge trial. So the first site will be a control and then there'll be training and the intervention and then the next one we'll, we'll do the control and the intervention and then the third one. So out of a theory of change workshop which also involved patients as well as cl clinicians, it was identified we needed to train healthcare workers, including community care workers, in communication skills to give the information appropriately, in symptom management, both pharmacological management of symptoms and non-pharmacological management, and that self-management technique that the patients or the families can implement at the time of feeling so short of breath. They needed also to be a recognition of the psychosocial distress and how to manage that. We want to make sure that there's care at all levels, so there can be care in the home, which might be through a community-based organization that has been accredited against certain standards. And there may be community um, clubs where they, they have like a support group, and then in their primary health care facility when they go for their checkups. Because mostly these patients are getting their, their treatment and their management when they pre present to the emergency centre because they're not going for the routine checks and managing their case. They're getting a panic attack and they're rushing into the emergency centre, which we're hoping to reduce those. And then we will look at these outcomes, patient, family, healthcare workers and the facility level outcomes. Thank you very much. Any questions for Liz? Thanks for your... Indulgence? Yes, one question. Well, firstly, thank you very much for your presentation. So my question is around the your first your first presentation outlining what the what the um, division of uh, um, does. So I was I was wondering because you in your teaching you you mentioned uh, medical students. I was wondering how much collaboration there's been between your division and the Department of Health and, uh, and Rehabilitation Sciences. Because I would imagine that that um, did the, for example the division of physiotherapy and occupational therapy respectively would would have much would have. Um, much to do with much to do with a great um, deal. Palliative. A re yeah. a, 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 I mean, a great deal to do with it. But palliative care is a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary intervention. So, especially when we're looking at these patients with a chronic lung disease, OT and physio is a really important intervention, which doesn't often happen. So, we've been talking a lot to the Department of Re of uh, Rehab Sciences. We do. I think one lecture in the three years and one intervention. So we, we've had that tiny drop in the ocean. But one of the things that I was hoping to do is actually to have the students follow the blog 
of a person who's looking after either themselves. So, so when I did that lecture the one year, I had somebody with um, uh, multiple sclerosis, no, with um, motor neuron disease who was writing his blog. He'd been a footballer and a footballer co coach, and he was now in a wheelchair. And the other was a, a mom of a child with cystic fibrosis. And just following that as a case would be a wonderful way to be integrating that in the rehab sciences. And we do have um, speech therapists currently on our postgraduate diploma, but you write about the, we need more inter integration in the rehab sciences course. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Liz, um, and thanks, uh, Taz, for, for that. I would like to welcome um, Maya, who will be chairing the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. So again, you have 30 minutes. It's a lot of time. Let's start. Let's start. It's great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So... To start us off, this is the division um, in a few different places, in one place looking happy and another place is slightly less happy because one of those places is not work. Um, the division's fairly large. Um, uh, we have 13 registered PhD students, uh, 14 full-time research staff on this campus, and then a number of full-time research staff uh, based at Googs and lots of part-time research staff. More than 20 uh, MPH students, I didn't count them, sorry, every year. Uh, lots and lots of publications, that's a random guess, and, and research grants from what I could think of off the top of my head. I'm going to give you a 30-second introduction to some of the research that happens in the division. So we work with everything from randomized controlled trials, in this case uh, a group, a sort of adherence club model, uh, to pilot studies looking at stigma and, and sort of social support and mental health in young women particularly living with HIV. PrEP uh, in pregnancy and postpartum, so really important in a high prevalence HIV setting, the prevention of HIV. Um, mobile apps, mHealth, connecting people to care. Simulation modeling, this is again in a population of pregnancy and postpartum women. Um, HU2 looking at HIV exposed but uninfected individual children. So it, important again in high HIV prevalence settings with good, a, good ART coverage. And then two other things, a big multidisciplinary projects in lung health, looking at exposures and mechanisms and preventions across um, African countries. I'm going to run out of time. Biostatistical methods. And uh, finally, um, birth cohorts. So this one is an ongoing birth cohort in Drakenstein, looking at lung growth, really, but all sorts of things from microbiome to other exposures. And that brings us to the first of our three speakers. I'm going to please ask you to hold your questions until the end of the interest in time, and I will ask the speakers to introduce themselves and their projects, starting with Jablani. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is written on the slide. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the study that I'm doing. It's nested in the Drunkenstein Child Health Study. Um, it's on vitamin D. Uh, why vitamin D? Vitamin D is a essential nutrient that's known for um, regulating calcium and bone metabolism. But moreover, recently, vitamin D is associated with very complex physiological processes in the human body. And more recently, uh, vitamin D status is associated with wide range of uh, diseases and for us, so particular interest in um, child infectious diseases. And uh, in the literature, there is um, a very high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency repeat, reported in uh, in children, and there is no data available in South Africa looking at this. <laughs> So, for the purpose of this presentation, I um, want to look at the prevalence of vitamin D status in this bad cohort and also look at uh, some factors associated with vitamin D deficiency. So, the setting, a uh, little bit about 
where Drunkenstein is. Uh, I've put the map for you so that you can see where this is. Uh, so the red dot, it's Drunkenstein, um, a sub-district, which is part of a Cape Wineland district. Um, but the study site where Drunkenstein Childhood Study is happening, it's in two communities. One is Mbeguin, which is a township, um, and the other one is in some part of Pal, uh, the town. So the, these communities are literally separated by a road. Um, I'm going to skip this because I can. <laughs> um, what is vitamin D deficiency? Um, there's a lot of literature about about it, uh, but the best biomarker for vitamin D deficiency is uh, circulating um, vitamin um, D in in, the, in in this human body. There is no consensus of what um, is vitamin D deficiency. Each group come up there with their own um, cutoffs. Um, just to illustrate this um, a table, the most common um, categories or cutoffs that people use, but there are so many others. Um, in fact, there's a paper, a review paper that just published this year. It showed over 20 different cutoffs uh, for, for vitamin D deficiency. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'll use these cutoffs. Um, just a little bit about um, uh, vitamin D metabolites. There are two forms of vitamin D. There is vitamin D3, which human beings make, and vitamin uh, D2, which come from food and uh, supplements. Uh, for our study, we uh, measured um, vitamin D from um, samples came from this bad cohort when they were 6 to 10 weeks old. And we couldn't find a lab that could analyze this in South Africa, so we shipped the specimen to Norway. And in Norway, they used this uh, HPLC system to measure these, um, these metabolites. Uh, just to note that uh, the HPLC um, system have some limits. Uh, they are at lower level uh, concentration of these metabolites, it cannot um, detect or provide reliable measurement. And the limits are here. So, just to summarize uh, uh, the methods, we use proportion to estimate prevalence and use a wide range of regression models to investigate this association. Results, um, so the pet cohort is over 1,000 uh, kid mother pairs, but uh, at six to 10 weeks, we could only find uh, 774 children. Just to highlight on this table, the differences by sites, uh, kids in Numbeguini, uh, lots of kids are ex HIV exposed. Um, uh, in teasing human, uh, most kids are exposed either to maternal smoking uh, or um, household or what you call secondary uh, hand smoking. And there are differences between this side in terms of their socioeconomic status. Now, prevalent. Uh, I'm only presenting two of the metabolites I spoke about because the other one, which is vitamin D, was only one kid that have um, resulted uh, above the limit that the system could detect. Uh, on vitamin D3, uh, so there are differences by site, as you can clearly see on, the, on, the, on this graph. Uh, the overall prevalence of vitamin D deficiency is about 23%. And in T.C. Newman, it's higher. It's about 
34%, while Lembeguini is uh, 12%. So there are huge uh, variation by, um, uh, by site. And uh, the epimeric vitamin D3, the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency is even higher. Um, overall, about 78%. And again, there's some um, uh, variation by site. Uh, I'm just presenting one of the models I have just because there's no time. I wish I had 30 minutes to present this. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we'll stratify by site because as you would have seen in the previous slide, there are very clear um, distinction between these sites. Um, some of the predictors of vitamin D deficiency uh, sex, uh, the seasonality, uh, but the biggest uh, predictor is a type of feeding. Um, summarize, we've seen high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in this bad cohort. Um, the strongest predictor is type of feeding and a clear uh, variation by site. Uh, strength of this uh, study, is, this is the first uh, study to, at least in South Africa, we can claim <laughs> to look at these different metabolites in this pediatric age group. And because it's early stage, I couldn't uh, include all um, important predictors in the model I just presented. So what, uh, so implication, so I was um, bullet to talk about implication of this that I didn't want to, but I was. And um, so it's clear based on the findings that uh, 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 feeding practices is, is something that we could look into if we want to ad address this issue. And as I said earlier, it's um, uh, the, the study we want to look uh, to investigate further the impact of vitamin D deficiency on uh, child health outcomes in the in this pet cohort. And this is the people I'm working with, and the study is funded by uh, MRC. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elton, and I'm here to present uh, part of my work on um, estimating population level viral suppression in the Western Cape. So global targets for evaluating treatment effectiveness and uh, transmission risk call for approximately 73% of all the people living with HIV to be virally suppressed. So an important or key component of this is uh, going to be um, viral load monitoring. But unfortunately, there are few programmatic data uh, from sub-Saharan Africa available. And when available, uh, routine viral load data are often overlooked due to concerns regarding uh, completeness, accuracy, uh, representativeness, among other things. And um, a consequence of this is usually um, a reliance on um, in community surveys and also um, multiple cluster indicator surveys, despite them being high cost and also low frequency, meaning that estimates that you get are usually just a snapshot, maybe just one year here, one year there. So part of what we wanted to do was to try and um, uh, develop and demonstrate a method uh, for the evaluation of annual progress um, towards the overall 1990-90 uh, target, which is that 73% um, in the Western Cape, using primarily routinely collected um, public sector lab data. So the additional data that we, we used um, included Statistics South Africa data, uh, that is the media population estimates, and also uh, the Tembisa model, uh, version 4.1. So we had a database of tests of about uh, 2 million tests, but as I said, this is a database of tests, not individuals. So there was a need to perform 
uh, record linkage procedure. Uh, part of that record linkage procedure um, entailed uh, doing some dis deterministic linkage, which was followed by uh, probabilistic linkage, where we used uh, what, we, what they call the Jarrow Winkler algorithm. And also, we made use of uh, hierarchical clustering. So, from what we got, we had different cutoff values for that dis for the distance metric, which is the Jarrow Winkler distance metric, and we created summary scores, um, which you evaluate if it's above a certain threshold, you would say it's a match. If it's below, it's not a match. So we used that also as part of our, our um, sensitivity analysis. And as part of uh, eva uh, evaluating link linkage validity, we compared the estimates that we got for the number of unique individuals uh, with the ones that are given by the Western Cape Department of Health. So part of what we got, um, when we looked at the differences between our estimates and those that, that, that were given uh, by the Department of Health, the Western Cape Department of Health, we noticed that um, higher thresholds of this Jaro Winkler score, of this Jaro Winkler, yeah, Jaro Winkler score, were producing estimates that were relatively closer to the Western Cape Department of Health. And not doing any linkage before you do any estimation uh, was producing uh, poorer results, uh, which is um, what we see from the deterministic uh, and the full name uh, that you will see there, which is the furthest from uh, what we have there. Uh, part of what we also did is we uh, defined viral, viral suppression as um, any viral load which was less than a thousand copies. Uh, we defined the viral status of an individual in a particular year as the last test occurring in that particular year. And we made the assumption that uh, people who are not in K or who are not in our database, uh, were assumed, they were assumed to be viremic, that is having a viral load which is greater than um, a thousand. So we calculated viral suppression, population viral suppression, uh, by saying the individuals who are virally suppressed in a specific period, uh, divided by uh, the total number of people who are living with HIV, where the number of living with HIV was estimated using the media population estimates and also the Tembisa model, that is the HIV prevalence from the Tembisa model. Some of the results that we got, um, importantly, the takeaway take from this table is that um, population vital suppression has been increasing. Uh, 2008, it was around 12.2%, and 2017, around 51%, which is like an increase of about 300%. Disaggregating by age and sex, we see that um, women generally have performed better than the males. Uh, we also see that... Um, People who are aged between 15 and 24 uh, generally performed poorer than everybody else, uh, as we see that they had the least uh, viral suppression rates. Also, commendably, uh, we would see that in 2017, uh, the women were closest to achieving the target, whereas they were at around uh, 72%, and uh, the target is around 73% by 2020. When we compared the estimates that we got uh, with those that are uh, found from, for example, the Tembisa model, and also from the intermittent um, surveys that I was speaking about, we found our estimates to be close to the ones that we, get, what, that we got from the other, other surveys. And when we look at 2017, there was um, the HSRC study that, was, that took place with all of South Africa. Their estimate was around 52.4% for the overall 1990 target, and we have around 51%, which is quite close and which is encouraging. So in conclusion, uh, what we found was that um, uh, we would need to perform this record linkage. Uh, if, you, if you're going to estimate population viral suppression using uh, routine data, routine lab data, you would need to perform record, record linkage before you actually do it. Um, also, there is a need for further targeting. Uh, of HIV testing and art initiation strategies uh, that were that are aimed at men and also uh, youths, people aged 15 to 24. But the important take home is that significant process, progress has been made in the Western Cape, though the overall target of getting 73% uh, 
of people living with HIV being virally suppressed is still a, a, a way off. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lengiwe, and this project that I'm presenting on investigated the association of obesity and gestational weight gain with adverse birth outcomes in HIV-infected women in Cape Town. So obesity is a major public health concern in women, especially in our context. In South Africa, almost 70% of women are overweight or so obese, and this is the largest prevalence in Africa. So in pregnancy, obesity, which is a BMI index of greater than or equals to 30, and high gestational weight gain, which is a pregnancy weight gain that is greater than 75th percentile, have both been shown to be associated with adverse birth outcomes, which are in a similar direction. These birth outcomes include high birth weight and large size for gestational age infants. Another major public health concern in women of childbearing age is HIV infection and ART use. As we all know that South Africa has the, the highest HIV prevalence and largest ART program in the world. So both HIV infection and ART use in pregnancy have also been shown to be associated with adverse birth outcomes, which include low birth weight and small size for gestational age infants. So these birth outcomes are in the opposite direction to those of obesity and high gestational weight gain. So obesity and HIV infection have been studied separately in the literature because of the historical weight loss effects of HIV, but more recently, there are increasing concerns about the excessive weight gain that is observed among non-pregnant adults that are initiating ART. And there's still limited data on whether this excessive weight gain exists in pregnant women. And there's also limited data on how the combined impact of both obesity and, and HIV may now affect the birth outcomes um, especially since the individual impacts are in the opposite direction, where obesity increases the risk of high birth weight and large size for gestational age infants, and HIV or ART increases the risk of low birth weight and small size for gestational age infants. And so the aim of our study was to investigate the association of obesity and high gestational weight gain with adverse birth outcomes in HIV-infected women that are using ART. And so we enrolled pregnant adult women that were attending their first antenatal care at Guguletu Maternity Obstetric Unit between April 2015 and October 2016. And we prospectively followed them through to delivery. And a total of 3,972 women who were pregnant um, were enrolled. So we had both HIV infected and HIV uninfected. This group of HIV uninfected women was only included for comparison purposes. So we call this group an overall cohort. This overall cohort was followed through medical records and was used to assess the association of obesity at first antenatal care with birth outcomes. And then we had a subset of HIV infected women who came early for their first antenatal care. And so this subset was used um, to study the association of gestational weight gain and birth outcomes because we followed them um, through a series of study visits where we were able to collect weight measurements. In the analysis, we included women that had live singleton births and complete data on our exposures and outcomes of interest. And so in the overall cohorts, we had a total of 2,000 828 women, and in the subset cohorts, we included a total of 471 women. We used a regression to assess our outcomes, and these are the results of the overall cohort. So this figure shows the prevalence of obesity as at first antenatal care visit by HIV status. And the key finding is that there is a similarly high obesity prevalence in both HIV uninfected and infected women. 
This table shows the maternal baseline characteristics uh, overall and stratified by BMI category. So obese women were likely to be older, to present late um, for their first antenatal care, and to have higher gravidity compared to women that had normal BMI. This table shows the association of birth outcomes with obesity in HIV uninfected women and infected women. The reference category for this group was HIV uninfected women who had normal weight, and the reference category for this group was HIV infected women who also had normal weight. And as we expected, we found that in HIV uninfected women, obesity is associated with, high, with reduced risk of low birth weight and small size for gestational age infants. And inversely, obesity in HIV uninfected women was associated with high risk of high birth weight and large size for gestational age infants. And then in HIV infected women, we also saw that obesity is also associated with a reduced risk of low birth weight and small size for gestational age infants. And there was a trend towards a high risk of high birth weight and large size for gestational age infants. However, this was not statistically significant and we think this could be because of the opposing effect of HIV infection. But what is important to note about this results in HIV infected women that are obese is that now these associations are in the opposite direction to those of the individual effects of HIV infection. These are the results of the subset cohorts. And this figure shows the prevalence of high gestational weight gain by BMI category. And the key finding is that high gestational weight gain was mostly prevalent in women that had normal um, BMI at their first antenatal care. So women who had high gestational weight gain um, were likely to be younger and to be premigravid compared to those who had normal gestational weight gain. High gestational weight gain was associated with high risk of high birth weight and large size for gestational age infants. And so in the overall cohorts, we showed that obesity in HIV infected women is associated with reduced risk of low birth weight and small size for gestational age infants. And then we also saw a trend towards high risk of high birth weight and large size for gestational age infants. And then in the subset cohorts, we showed that high gestational weight gain in HIV infected women is associated with high risk of high birth weight and large size for gestational age infants. And so these results suggest that obesity and high gestational weight gain have more pronounced impact on birth weight and size for gestational age compared to HIV infection alone. Um, however, we can still see the um, individual effects of, of HIV infection. And so the limitation of the study is that we did not have a pre-pregnancy BMI. And so we are reporting on obesity um, in the first antenatal care visit but we were able to adjust for gestational age at enrollment um, in the analysis. And so the conclusion that can be drawn from this study is that there's a high obesity prevalence in pregnant HIV infected women that are using ART and that obesity and high gestational weight gain modify the previously reported association of HIV infection and ART use with adverse birth outcomes. And so therefore further research is needed to assess the long-term impact of in utero exposure to both HIV and, and, and obesity on infant health. Thank you. So because all of our wonderful speakers were at time, we have one minute for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Um, my question is around, and it comes from the other work that I've been doing with the Hospice Palliative Care Association and linking uh, people who are HIV positive to treatment and to care and uh, um, adhe and supporting adherence. We've also had the concept that we need to have improved strategies for identifying men and youth. And I would be very interested to know what strategies you might have thought of um, to improve um, this linkage to care for men and youth. I'm going to say good luck, Alton. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> uh, this was mainly just uh, descriptive, so we haven't really yeah, thought about that part yet. Hopefully we will. <laughs> Sorry, Liz, but he's the statistician, so. <laughs> Thanks very much. My question is for Lengi. Um, Thanks very much for your talk. <laughs> um, I was... Going to ask, have you looked or are you going to be looking at other adverse birth outcomes? So you've looked at um, at birth weight, but then obesity is also associated with, with stillbirth, as is uh, diabetes, um, which is also associated with obesity. And so I was wondering, you restricted your analysis to live-born infants. If you had any plans to look at, at pregnancy losses as well and see how that's affected. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, so like you are saying, we, we only looked at live singleton birds. Um, we haven't done um, the analysis on uh, pregnancy losses, but it's something that we are still going to look at. Thank you very much, Maya. Um, the last um, session is um, for cider. Um, anytime I hear cider, like, is it the cider we drink? Um, <laughs> then we will be drunk to stupor. Um, so I welcome Miriam um, to the last um, session. You have 30 minutes, a lot of time. Okay. How do I turn this into... There we go, sorry. Okay. I hope so. Um, okay, thanks everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Marianne Davies and it's a great privilege to welcome you to the CIDA session of this afternoon. I think at this point in the afternoon I need to congratulate all of you for still being here and thank you and also reassure all of us that we are in the home straight and so we're going to pretend we were in Van Nikirk in the last uh, 100 meters of the 400 meters and sprint for the finish line. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to give a very brief overview of CIDA research. We're then going to ask each of our speakers to come up. They're going to introduce themselves. They are going to be very bad mannered and not say any thank yous or acknowledgements and they are going to focus and use their time on the highlights of their research and then we'll have um, a couple of minutes for questions at the end. So I've summarized the side of mission in the red circle in the center and how do we achieve that mission? I think uh, really two big components of CIDA's work. The first is doing analyses of routine data, mainly on HIV, but uh, you may be surprised to know we do do some things other than HIV, including other infectious diseases and a big focus on maternal and child health. And we use that data both for surveillance and monitoring, as well as for observational research, um, particularly in uh, uh, certain cohorts. And then linked to that, at some of our cohorts and often shared with EPI and Biostats, we have some detailed cohort studies where we collect additional information beyond the routine and also um, do implementation science in the form of randomized controlled trials of particular interventions. And uh, some of those studies uh, may answer Liz's question about strategies for retaining people and linking them to care. Supporting all of this and a huge part of our work is our strategic information team who are involved in development and support of the systems through which this routine data is captured. And none of the both the observational cohorts as well as the detailed cohorts would be possible. And in fact, a lot of the work that is presented by other groups in our center would be, or in, in the school would be possible without that team. And then what do we use all this information for? Obviously, to inform policy 
policy and practice, and then also to inform mathematical models that tell us what's happening about the HIV epidemic and increasingly about other diseases as well. And we are very proud to be home to Tembisa as well as to Microcosm, which are two important uh, demographic models of disease. So just to relate that to what you're going to hear today, today you're going to hear about the individual Kailicha cohort, and that is supported by information from the province because people don't always stay in one place and go back to the same facility. So we've increasingly learned that we need to make use of data uh, from other facilities and about other comorbidities. You're going to hear from one of our research cohorts, which is the B-positive cohort, looking at the implementation of universal art for all pregnant and breastfeeding women. And then this data contributes to regional cohort collaborations. Um, at CIDA, we are the home of um, the IDEA Southern Africa Regional Cohort Collaboration, and we also participate in global cohort collaborations. And you are going to hear about today, it happens to be adolescents from those collaborations, um, both the outcomes of adolescents with perinatally acquired HIV and also about mental health and substance use in adolescents living with HIV in Johannesburg and and Harare, and I'd like to say that there's a wealth of data available, and for those of you who haven't come to speak to us, please do come and speak to us if you have interesting ideas about what we could, analyses that you would like to do or projects that you're interested in. I've had two conversations in the last week, which is great. Um, just to talk briefly about the strategic information team, they are involved in all aspects of improving or developing software to improve routine monitoring from deciding what should be collected, designing the software to collect it, implementing it through training and um, providing support at facilities and then driving how it is used um, to make sure that our routine information systems actually are used and strengthened to guide the response to the HIV epidemic and more recently to actually improve patient care at an individual level. Um, all of that is used to inform mathematical models. I'm not going to go into the models, but just to say that Tembisa is an amazing resource for the country and it's recently had a new release and I encourage you to have a look at some of those results. And with that, I'm going to ask our first speaker, Dorothy, to come and... Uh, and take us into the presentations. Uh, thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been introduced, so I'll go straight into my background. So over 1.3 million women living with HIV, they give birth annually to infants born HIV exposed and infected uh, with effective PMTC in pregnancy and during breastfeeding. So many of the infants, they are not achieving comparable health and developmental outcomes as infants who are born HIV unexposed and uninfected with poorer growth, health and survival among the HEU infants compared to HUU infants. So the concern is around fetal exposure to HIV um, and art in utero and the compromised fetal and infant growth. So our objective is to compare birth weight for age set score and length for age set score. In infants who are born HIV exposed uninfected versus the comparator group of HIV unexposed uninfected. And then we also restricted our um, uh, population to HIV exposed uninfected infants only, looking on the duration to exposure to art in utero, that is from conception versus after conception. Um, so for our method, we used the um, observational cohort B positive, which was done in Google, which is a primary health care center, which serves about 350,000 people. And the antenatal HIV prevalence was 30% in 2016. So we enrolled women, uh, pregnant women who were 18 years and above living with HIV or without HIV and had gestational age less than 20 week, eight, 28 weeks which was estimated by ultrasound, uh, last menstrual period in uh, symphysal fundal height. And they had to reside within the area for 12 months postpartum. 
So questionnaires were administered by trained interviewers uh, postnatally at seven days, 10 weeks, six months, and lastly at 12 months. There was a rapid HIV test, which was done for all HIV uh, negative women on all or antenatal visits and uh, also at deliver. And then an HIV DNA PCR test was done at birth for the HIV exposed in France and a repeat um, test was also done at 10 weeks. This is all standard of care. Uh, so for our analysis, the primary outcome is weight for age Z score and length for age Z scores, which were generated using the intergrowth trend phase two. It adjusts for gestational age and infant sex. And then the second outcome, uh, preterm birth defined as gestational age less than 37 weeks. So we evaluated data for 741 mother infant pairs with 373 HUU infants and 368 HEU infants. Uh, we observed that women living with HIV uh, they were older than HIV uninfected women and they had more pregnancies and um, a higher proportion of women living with HIV, they were formerly employed. And then we observed more preterm birth for women living with HIV compared to women without, which was 12% versus 9%, although this difference was not significant. And then we also observed a difference in the mean weight for age and length for age for HIV exposed infants compared to HIV unexposed infants. Um, so for our results, uh, in our linear model, we observed that uh, the weight for age set score is lower in HIV exposed uninf um, uninfected infants versus HIV unexposed uninfected. And to length for age set score, it's similarly low, uh, but it's, there's no difference when you adjust for maternal age, gravidity, and employment status, as well as maternal status, marital status. Um, so in conclusion, we observed that HIV exposed uninfected infants, they experienced poor mean weight for age Z score and length for age Z score at birth compared to uh, infants born to women without HIV. And we feel that there is a need to identify clinical significance of growth disparities between the HIV exposed uninfected and HIV exposed unexposed, uninfected infants. And there's also need to establish the safest ARV, uh, ARV drug for use during pregnancy. Um, thank you, as I rush to sit down. Good afternoon. I can't see my notes, is that gonna be fine? <laughs> Okay, I'll have to speak from memory. Anyway, um, my name is Jonathan and I'm going to sort of share with some preliminary results. Um, we looked into resuppression after viremia versus virologic failure in Kaidiche in South Africa. Right, so a bit of background. Um, we routinely do virally testing, I think most of you know this, um, just to identify individuals and failing regimens. Um, and if someone has an unsuppressed viral load over a thousand copies, we follow up um, we give them enhanced adherence counseling and we follow up and test them again. And if they have another high viral load, we, it's recommended that we switch them to second line. Um, sometimes patients resuppress without switching. Um, and we don't really know if that means it's fine, if that resuppression sticks or if it's, it's not durable. So some people have also been advocating that even if somebody has a single high viral load, that means the regimen is failing and we should switch them. Um, so, we included three clinics in Kailicha. Um, we included art naive adults over 15 years who initiated in April 2010 and March 2018. We excluded if they hadn't initially virally suppressed, and we censored when we no longer had viral loads available. Right, if patients experienced the first episode of viremia or confirmed virologic failure, we described proportions and relative risk of subsequent virologic suppression based on the binary regression. And we defined four types of suppression. Initial continuous suppression after antiretroviral therapy initiation. Um, resuppression after viremia, that's that single high viral load. 
uh, resuppression after failure, that's two consecutive hour loads, but they weren't switched, and resuppression after failure and switching regimen. And we followed them each up for 48 months um, and estimated the time from that suppression or resuppression to rebound. Right, patients were 70% female and 34, 34 years old. Um, about 55% of the patients were resuppressed at the next viral load after their first episode of viremia. That's in the table. Um, patients who failed but did not switch were less likely to suppress uh, compared to those who resuppressed um, after switching regimen after their first failure. And again, I refer you to the table. Uh, you see there that duration on art and other things didn't have a significant impact. So we had 12, over 12,000 patients contributing over 40,000 patient months uh, to the kaplan meyer estimates from time to viremia, either from suppression or resuppression. And that's the figure on the right. Uh, median duration on art at resuppression was nine and a half months. And at 48 months after resuppression, 92% of those resuppressed after viremia was still durably resuppressed, um, compared to 85% of those who resuppressed after failure and switching, and 58% of those resuppressed after failure without switching. And that's that blue line over there. So, a high proportion of patients with viremia achieved and maintained durable resuppression without switching. Patients with virologic failure, that's again, that's two consecutive viral loads uh, who did not switch, had very poor virologic outcomes in terms of both resuppression and the durability of that resuppression. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon, I'm Kathleen and today I'm going to talk to you about long-term virologic responses um, to art in patients who entered adherence clubs in Kailicha. So in 2018, there are estimated 4.6 million people who are on art, and we expect this number to increase as universal test and treaters rolled out. And so there's really a need for differentiated service delivery models. Um, one such model in Cape Town is adherence clubs that have been here since 2011. These are designed for stable patients on art. Um, they go to five sessions per year, and in these sessions they have brief symptom screenings, group discussions, and collect two months of pre-practice art. So we conducted a retrospective cohort study among these patients who entered between 2011 and 2016, were aged between 16 and 85, and had a viral load test within the 15 months before enrollment. Our outcomes of interest were viral load completeness, an elevated viral load, which is one viral load greater than a thousand copies, and then confirmed virologic failure, which were two viral consecutive viral loads within a year. So we um, analyzed just over 8,000 patients who contributed 16,000 years of um, follow-up, person years of follow-up, um, and they were followed up for a medium of 1.7 years. At um, AC entry, 74% were female, 46 were aged between 40. Five, uh, 35 and 44, and they had a really long duration, median duration on art of 4.8 years. And so when we look at their first test after entry, we see about 10% um, of these patients never tested, and of those who tested, a large proportion of them remained suppressed. However, um, just uh, about 6% had an elevated viral load, and the median time to this elevated viral load was 363 days. And when we look at the second test among this group, we see that about a third of these patients never retested, and of those who tested, about 291 patients, 50% um, of them experienced confirmed virologic failure. And the time between these tests, the median time was 112 days, um, but the overall proportion of failure in the cohort was about 2%. So when we looked at viral load completeness over time in these patients, we see that over 80% of them remained suppressed through 40 months, and of those who were tested, more than 90% remained suppressed. When we looked at predictors for our outcomes, we found that older age, increasing year of entry, and higher CD4 counts were protective against an elevated viral load, however not we didn't find any strong predictors for failure. So our study demonstrates that we found low rates of viral, elevated viral loads and confirmed failure, and most of these patients were well monitored and remained stable despite the rapid expansion of this model of care, really supporting the continued rollout within Cape Town. Thank you.
Um, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Priscilla Tsondai, and I'll be presenting on the characteristics and outcomes of adolescents that are living with perinatally acquired HIV within the IDEA Southern Africa uh, cohort. So, of the um, known 1.6 million adolescents living with HIV, approximately 40% reside within Southern Africa. And this group of adolescents living with HIV is comprised of those that acquired HIV perinatally, that is in utero, during birth, or postnatally um, while breastfeeding. And these which are referred to adolescents living with perinatally acquired HIV. And also those that acquired HIV non-perinatally. Um, so the objective of our analysis was to describe the characteristics and uh, the long-term outcomes of these adolescents living with perinatally acquired HIV within IDEA Southern Africa, because to date most research has not um, evaluated this group, and also to determine the predictors of mortality during um, adolescence. So, uh, to be included in uh, our analysis, we included patients that, that were in care within the IDEA Southern Africa sites, and we assumed perinatal infection if a patient had entered care before the age of 13 without any documented non-perinatal HIV acquisition, because mode of transmission is not routinely captured in most uh, of uh, the sites. And uh, to be included, they also had to have at least one visit during adolescence. We followed these adolescents up from the time of their first visit to the date of either their transfer, death, loss, or up to their 22nd birthday, whichever occurred first. We looked at the characteristics and uh, at enrollment into care, at art start, at various ages during adolescence, and at last visit. And we compared this characteristic um, amongst those that had entered care before the age of 10 and those that entered care between the ages of 10 to 13, which we assumed were the slow progressors. And then the predictors of mortality after the age of 13 years we identified using the Cox proportional um, hazards regression. So over 25,000 adolescents living with perinatally acquired HIV were included in our analysis from those six countries uh, in purple with the shade of purple showing uh, the percentage that each country contributed. Um, and then at first visit, the median age was 8.6 years, median year was 2009, and about 51% were uh, classified as severely immunosuppressed. And then at odd start, about two thirds had a WHO stage three or four disease, and 55% were severely immunosuppressed. And then cross-sectionally at database closure, those were the outcomes with the purple segment of uh, that donut showing retention. And as you can see, about two-thirds of those that enrolled before the age of 10 uh, were classified as still being actively in care at database closure, compared to just under half of those that um, enrolled into care at an older age. And then looking at loss to follow up, the red segment, about 16% of those that had enrolled before the age of 10 had been lost to follow up compared to about a third of those that enrolled during adolescence. And then looking at the median CD4 cell count and median height for age set scores, and also comparing this uh, among those that enrolled before 10 and between the ages of 10 and 13, we can see that the blue line, which is those that enrolled before the age of 10, seem to be doing better, both in terms of their median CD4 counts and their height for age set scores. And then looking at this by calendar period, the purple top line is representing the later years, that's 2014, 2017. And we can see that for, for um, the median CD4 count, for the younger adolescents, we seem to have gotten better compared to, for example, before 2010. But then this becomes concerning when we're looking at the older adolescents, where um, with all the progress that has happened in the past few years, we are still their, their outcomes have not changed um, significantly. And then looking at the predictors of mortality, we found that immunosuppression and having impaired growth increased the risk of dying. But after adjusting for the other covariants, age at entry into care and six uh, were not associated with mortality. So in conclusion, adolescents living with perinatally acquired HIV have suboptimal retention, immunologic and virologic outcomes as they age, and interventions aimed at improving outcomes for this growing population um, are urgently needed. And also that uh, adolescents living with perinatally acquired HIV that enroll into care during adolescence seem to have poorer outcomes and probably need closer monitoring. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mpotladi. Um, 
um, presenting a study on mental health and virological treatment outcomes of HIV positive adolescents who use substances. Um, so the background, um, mental health and substance use disorders are important causes of uh, disability um, globally and are common among adolescents. And importantly, um, they've been associated with negative HIV outcomes. Um, and we know that these um, disorders are not being screened for, um, even though they're recommended that they are screened for. And so there's poor implementation of screening um, services. So in 2018, we conducted a cohort study to implement routine screening of um, these disorders at two large antenatal um, clinics in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. Um, our participants uh, were um, clinic attendees aged 9 to um, 19 years of age. Um, and when they consented, they underwent pre-screening. Um, and if the pre-screening was positive, then they, um, con they were given um, full screens um, that were uh, based on validated tools uh, by trained nurses. Um, and what we're looking to do is to estimate the prevalence of substance use in this cohort, um, but also look at um, associations of substance use uh, with virological failure and look at some of the comorbidities of those who um, reported substance abuse. So um, if we just look at our two study sites and we look at some of the differences between the South African and Zimbabwe site, we see that in our South African um, sites that our participants um, overall um, were initiated on ART at a much younger age. Um, we see that they had higher CD4 counts and that they were on ART um, much longer. Um, and at the time of the uh, screening was conducted, they were also um, younger. Um, of the total cohort, to, uh, just over 2,000 uh, participants, we had 60% who, um, who took part in the pre-screening. They consented for pre-screening. Um, and not shown here, but 33% of those actually were positive for their pre-screening. Um, and so overall, um, and this is on based on the overall people who pre-screened, 8% screened positive for a uh, full screen. And in red there, we see that only um, about 1% of them were positive for the alcohol and substance use um, screening. So um, if we take that 1%, so there are the 14 participants who um, were positive for um, the full screen of substance abuse, we see there that um, there's a uh, comorbidity um, associated with other mental disorders in over half of those participants. Um, and yeah. Sorry, so in over half of those participants. So we did a further analysis to look at substance abuse um, and what it was associated with. And we see in that our univariant uh, model that they are, there's a strong association of substance use and virological failure. Um, and even in our adjusted models, there's still a strong association. We do acknowledge and note that the, um, the sample size was very small. There were 14 participants in this um, sample. So um, in conclusion, we think that um, uh, mental health and substance use are important um, uh, findings in adolescents in HIV care in South Africa and in um, Zimbabwe. And um, we actually think that um, we probably underestimated uh, the prevalence of these disorders and that there, despite the small sample size, that there's still a strong association um, with uh, virological failure. Um, and we are hoping to do um, further studies um, with slightly larger sample sizes um, and that it's probably very important that we do implement screening and um, of these disorders um, in order to improve HIV outcomes for adolescents. Um, thank you. I want to thank all of our speakers for um, sticking beautifully to time and really uh, racing through their presentations. I think you are all good for the presentation Olympics. Um, and I think uh, we probably have time for just a couple of questions. I'm seeing none, which they're all gonna be relieved about. Landon has a question, thank you. 
My question is from Bo. Is our talk? Oh, the, the prevalence is, it was a fa it's a fabulous study, it's a really hard study to do in a, in a really great study, um, but the prevalences do seem a little bit low. Why do you think that's so? Um, the, uh, sorry. So probably two factors. Um, so they, they had a pre-screening questions, there were just four questions, and the one for um, alcohol use was just about whether or not you had used alcohol. So it was a very general question. Um, and then when they went on to the full screen, they used a CAGE questionnaire, and these are adolescents. And if you look at the CAGE questionnaire, the questions on it, they probably are not suited for adolescents. So we've had to acknowledge that the tool itself was probably not the appropriate tool to use for adolescents. Uh, but it's a sensitive question, and it was being provided as an interviewed um, question. So if they'd probably done it as self-assessments, if we might have picked up a bit more as well. Yeah, and the expanded study, which we're going to be doing now at multiple idea sites across um, the global collaboration, we will be uh, using audit um, because of this problem that we, we picked up. Um, John. I got a mic, I got a mic. Um, I, I, let me ask, um, perhaps a question, I don't know, <laughs> um, to Dorothy. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. What I wanted you to clarify is you kind of use the weight for um, age and the length for age Z scores as explanatory variables to explain something, okay? When in themselves, they are kind of determined elsewhere. So you run into the problem of endogeneity. That means something that is determined elsewhere, you brought it in and using it to determine something else. Um, so in themselves, they are not, strictly speaking, independent variables or, or nice explanatory variables. So why, why, how did you control for that? Okay, so uh, thank you. So um, what we... Um, what we did to generate them, we used the gestational age at birth in the infant sex. And then this tool, it generated the set scores, which are now standard, rather than just using the weight of the infant or the length of the infant. So uh, since the two standardized these uh, set scores, um, we are then looking at the difference either when the infant is born to an HIV-infected mother or not. Since they are now standardized its Z scores after adjusting for the gestational age in the infant sex. Okay, all right. <laughs> Okay, I know Jonathan didn't want any questions, so I'm going to torment him with the hardest one um, as our last question of the day. And Jonathan, we know we're getting dolutegravir, the wonder drug, very soon, and you were talking about um, viral suppression and durability of resuppression. How would you redesign viral load monitoring, or how do you think we should rethink about it in the light of dolutegravir scale-up? Is that too hard? <laughs> um, I have no idea. Um... <laughs> I mean, I think Dolutegravir is going to be interesting because I think there's a lot of hesitancy to switch patients, even if they have five high viral loads, if there's any sense that there's an adherence issue. And I'm hoping that Dolutegravir is going to make, take some of the hesitancy away. Um, but I, don't, I think our system at the moment is pretty good. Um, so we did that cross-sectional survey where we found about between 85, between 80 and 90 percent viral monitoring coverage in Kailicha, so it's pretty good. And so, yeah, I think, I think we'll pick up if there are problems. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say to Shay and hand over to John. <laughs> <laughs> That's a classic one. <laughs> um, I think we have um, really come to the last lap of um, the research day. And I want to thank especially everyone who has participated in all forms, um, no matter how little it is, it's very well appreciated. So now I want to call on, uh, 
well, we got a slight change in plan because we wanted um, Dr. Tulare to present prizes to um, the poster winners, but she had um, duty calls, so she had to leave early. Um, so I would beg the head of department, uh, Professor Landon Meyer, to hand um, the prizes out. Um, so we usually, at our annual um, research day, we give prizes to best posters, bests. Um, so we're going to call out names, and if you're lucky, you get a prize. Do you have an envelope? Yeah, okay. I can have envelopes to open. I got an envelope, but it's not like a jack one. Yeah. <laughs> and what are the prizes? Posted cards. Oh, they're just envelopes. Yeah, they're, the they're, prizes are envelopes. They are vouchers. They are um, how do you call them? Um, online vouchers for books and stuff like that. Because oh, we're just, we are we are we are researchers. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll call out the names. And then we'll have one. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, there's no first prize, second prize, third prize. Um, I would call upon um, Abraham Opari. Um, he, this poster you've seen, um, and part of his presentation, Effectiveness of School Vision Screening and um, Programs in Reducing uncor Uncorrected Refractive Error Among Children in Low- and Middle-Income Countries, a Systematic Review. Thank you very much. Hooray for ophthalmology. Um, next, I will call on Tahira Kutbodian. Did I get it right? Kutbodian. Tahira. Um, Tahira's poster is the association between organos, organosulfate, organosulfate. Organophosphate. Okay. He was in the Organo I know he was. Okay, organos, yeah, I got something wrong, different here. So, <laughs> yeah, pesticide exposure and attempted suicide, a structural equation modeling approach. Thanks. Good. Great. And um, last but not least um, is Shani the Beer. <laughs> Our poster um, is on completeness of maternal HIV testing and repeat testing in Cape Town, South Africa. Thank you. <laughs> and I would keep um, London on the stage um, to do the vote of thanks. <laughs> thanks. Hi, everyone. I wanted to um, lead my vote of thanks with a huge thanks. A huge thanks to all of you, but in particular to Liza, who actually makes Research Day happen as the DRC administrator. Eliza, it is, I think John has flowers for you. Yeah, no, you do it. You do it. You do it. <laughs> it, is, um, it is quite incredible the amount of work that, it, that goes into preparing for today. And it was really And Liza, thank you very much, both for putting up with us on a day-to-day -day basis, <laughs> you, but, but in particular for, for all the hard work that goes into Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and then the easy work is done by the Departmental Research Committee. Uh, and so thanks to John and Jill and Maya and all the members of the DRC who, um, who do all this, a lot of the thinking um, that brings today together. So thanks very much to all of you. Yeah. And, and then lastly, I, I feel like I say the same thing every year at the end of Research Day, which is how incredible it is, how incredible the, the diversity of the work that takes place in our department is, how incredible the excellence of the work that takes place in our department is, uh, and how fun it is to bring us all together and to force John to listen to organophosphates <laughs> and me to listen to palliative medicine, and, and for us to be exposed to the breadth um, and, and significance that is the public health research that takes place in the school. Um, and so it is a special day, uh, and so thanks to all of you for being part of it. Yeah. Have a wonderful afternoon.